Uh, hello, uh, good morning, good evening, or whenever uh, you are listening to this. Uh, today we are going to uh, start with the main part of the uh, CN242. We have finished the theoretical uh, topics and chapters. Now uh, we are going to start with uh, the paradigm object-oriented programming. Uh, so we are going to focus on object-oriented programming paradigm uh, starting uh, with this week. Uh, the um, background assumption for you is you already have some uh, experience in C++ because of uh, data structure course. So we are going to skip some parts fast. So if you are feeling so, uh, please um, uh, return us in the interactive sessions and uh, department forms uh, to uh, fill in the uh, missing uh, pieces. Uh, so uh, from uh, previous chapters also, we have a very slight introduction to object-oriented programming already because we talk about abstraction. Uh, then we talk about encapsulation. Uh, encapsulation was uh, primarily based on the uh, abstract data types and the meaning of hiding some of the uh, data of uh, some package. So uh, we believe uh, you already know uh, uh, some of the things, so you have some background, so please refer to uh, especially encapsulation chapters uh, if you are missing the motivation uh, especially. Uh, so, uh, in this course, uh, we had chosen uh, C++ as our object-oriented programming uh, tool uh, because a couple of reasons. In Java, we have garbage collecting already, and so we don't have distractors. Uh, and we have um, uh, limited uh, access to parameter passing mechanisms and uh, the allocation of data, etc. Uh, that's why C++, C++ is more interesting uh, programming language for us. Uh, if you know C++, you will have a good background on Java, uh, missing the libraries. The only thing that is the uh, missing libraries for you. Uh, the uh, basics of object-oriented programming, the basic principles of object-oriented programming is actually those uh, four things here. Abstraction, you already know the meaning. Uh, so in real life, uh, we uh, have abstraction of real entities uh, in programming languages through object-oriented programming. For example, if you have a customer in your software, Customer can be an object. And in student information systems, for example, the student is an object, or a, a faculty is an object, or a course is an abstract, is an object. So we can have that abstraction thanks to object oriented programming. Uh, we put everything related to a student in some declaration body, uh, and we call that an object, a class. And, uh, together with hiding here, it will make that an encapsulation. So we create encapsulations over real life for our software entities uh, in order to end up in uh, uh, abstracted uh, access to them. The hiding will give us uh, the implementation detail of our abstraction of object hidden from the programmer so that uh, the programmer doesn't have to be uh, know the details, only the interface, which consists of uh, the uh, methods uh, or member functions. Uh, inheritance is the uh, polymorphism uh, part of the object-oriented programming. Most of the polymorphism and the especially runtime dynamism or uh, the uh, reuse of your software without recompilation uh, of the large part uh, depends on inheritance. Uh, so the uh, object uh, 
in the definition uh, of uh, the programming language definition of the object consists of the attributes, uh, we also call them member variables and methods, we call them member functions. Uh, this is a UML description of an object. We usually uh, distinguish between the attributes and the methods in this uh, syntax. Also, there are markers for showing the uh, interface and the details and so on. Uh, the name of the class is here, the attributes and the methods are listed as here. Uh, the, so uh, this is a declaration body. The state of uh, the object are kept in the attributes uh, and the methods will give you the behavior. Uh, in uh, early days of the uh, object-oriented programming, we have languages like uh, small talk modula, they uh, used to have a different uh, terminology. Uh, they call uh, the methods as messages and they think this uh, behavior of an object as message passing triggered by message passing. So when I uh, send get name message to a person, person will give you uh, his or her name. So it, the abstraction was like that. So also we uh, can use that terminology as well, uh, the messages instead of methods. We can call them messages. Those messages will trigger some behavior of the object, uh, or you can get some data out of that object thanks to sending messages. Uh, we, uh, are, we are used to use this calling methods, calling member functions types of terminology. So we will be using that uh, in this course. Uh, an object is an instance of a class, so we have a relation between a class and object uh, as the relation between the type and variable. So as you instantiate an object, uh, instantiate a class, you will get a new object. Uh, so the typical uh, definition looks like this. Uh, the, uh, we have a class person here. The attributes are defined here. Uh, we have uh, public denoting that the remaining part or following part of that label uh, are part of the interface, exported part of the class. The others by default are, pri uh, are private labels. That means they are hidden. Uh, they are part of the details of our abstraction. Uh, you can either uh, define your member functions in line that is inside of the class definition, or you just provide a prototype in the class definition like that and define outside. And if you choose to uh, define them outside, you have to provide this uh, class name with the scope operator. The two columns are called scope operator and you uh, define them like that. Uh, the uh, environment within each method is uh, what we call recursive collateral, uh, but the idea is everyone can call everyone without the order. So you can make recursive calls to a method uh, before or after it. So the uh, declaration uh, order uh, or within the class uh, does not uh, make does not matter if it's uh, everyone can access every other one. So that means uh, you could have defined this name at the end of the class definition. Still, this get name uh, would have been accessing. Uh, but uh, the order is significant for this label. So public label followed by all uh, public functions. Then you can start a new label private, then another public, then another private. Uh, all labels. Uh, modify uh, uh, the following uh, uh, declarations up to another link until another link. And uh, Java works. Uh, this is uh, slightly uh, different. So you define a person like that, 
and you need to specify uh, public keywords in all of the uh, definitions. So, for example, then you have two numbers, so you need to specify public uh, const, no, public string, let us say, get name, blah, blah, uh, and public set numbers, set numbers, and blah, blah. So instead of uh, the labels modifying the remaining key operations, uh, in Java, it will be uh, like that. We have this uh, modifiers, the public modifier repeated. Uh, in uh, Python, the things are a little bit uh, different. Uh, in Python, uh, we have uh, the class person will be defined like that. The attributes are not defined uh, in the body, but we define a constructor called in it itself. And if you like to define the attributes, this is the position and you have to give them some initial value. Like that. And you define all of the functions within the class uh, scope, so that will be, they will be available here. Okay, so this is the Python version of the pretty much same object here. So you return name here and so on. Okay. Set numbers of A will be Self number is A. Uh, so if I should put this like here, so this is the uh, Python correspondence of that. So pretty much the syntax uh, for languages are not much. Uh, uh, the syntax is diverse, but uh, the ideas are the same uh, between all uh, object-oriented languages. And Python, we had this constructor, uh, it is defined in a different way in C++. Uh, so, uh, for invocation of those functions and uh, the application of the object method, uh, we have this syntax, we define an object in uh, this way here, which will make this object an instance of the class. And if you use this dot followed by a method name, as if you are calling a regular uh, function, uh, but in the scope of the object, uh, means that object will get its method invoked, or that message is sent to that object, if you like that way. Uh, that get name function will be executed in the uh, context of the object. And it is going to modify the attributes of the object. This is the idea. So if you return name, it will be the name definition of uh, this uh, object here. Okay. Uh, within the uh, Member function, we can use this keyword. This is the reserved keyword added in C++. We have a small number of keywords added uh, to C in C++, and this is one of them. This is one of them. Uh, the, uh, it will give you the pointer to current object, okay? So that you can use uh, pointer-based uh, access to the members if you need so, especially if you are using da dynamic data structures, putting pointers to current object will help a lot. 
uh, in uh, Python it is itself also in Java we have uh, similar construct. Uh, so hiding is uh, quite uh, important in object oriented uh, languages, but it is not essential. One example is Python. Uh, Python doesn't have any hiding. Uh, in uh, other languages, in class definitions, uh, the hiding is uh, default. In C++, you can define object in two ways, either with class or struct, or good old C struct. If you use struct, everything will be public by default. If you use uh, class, everything will be private by default. Private means it is hidden. Public means it is accessible. In C++, we have three uh, access labels, private, protected, and public. Uh, and following members are modified by those labels. Uh, public is visible outside, part of the interface, private, hidden. Uh, protect, protected is only uh, significant when you are using inheritance. Otherwise, it will behave like private. So once uh, you uh, define uh, this private public, uh, in the scope of object, you can only use the uh, public uh, part. The private part is not used. Uh, please uh, note that this private public distinction is only uh, relevant or only significant when you are using the object context. You declare an instance, and from that instance, you are trying to access the member. Uh, within the uh, member functions, so within the body of the functions you are using, for example, in the set numbers, private, public doesn't have any significance. Everything is accessible. So you cannot uh, make the set number function uh, or prevent the set number function accessing no here or maybe here because the set number is in the class scope and the class scope you can access everything and the object scope as it is here you are an outsider you are in not in the declaration uh, scope of the class and the curly brace or uh, you do not use the scope of it so if you are outside of the class scope you cannot use private members, only public members. Uh, so this uh, scope is lexical, not runtime. Uh, that means you can always use some pointer tricks to access it. Okay. So you, uh, this is your class, this is your structure. Uh, you define a structure very similar to this class. And you assign this object to the structure object with some pointer trick and then access the members because there's no runtime check. The check is at the compiler. Uh, also, you can use this pointer trick to, for example, uh, get a fifth next pointer out of the class, uh, sorry, object, out of the object pointer. And it's going to give that area of memory. Uh, so, uh, the uh, abstraction is uh, any type of abstraction is possible. Uh, whatever your software is, you can create uh, abstractions, objects on that. Uh, you can consider your problem as entity, the, the things in the world as entities, the object, and then you create the whatever abstraction you are doing that. Uh, the idea here is uh, all attributes should be, if not, uh, Essential, they should be private, and you define their uh, state changing behavior through this method. Uh, and a major uh, addition to this implementing behavior is the data integrity. The reason behind this uh, hidden hiding uh, the hidden attributes is. Uh, avoiding uh, arbitrary modification of the attributes, uh, avoiding arbitrary uh, excess of data so that uh, having some invalid behavior. 
assume your registration system. Uh, if uh, the list of courses that a student uh, enrolls can be changed arbitrarily, you cannot enforce prerequisites, for example, or fail success or course capacity. You cannot enforce those if you let programmers arbitrarily uh, add new courses to a student enrolled uh, record. So what you need to do is you need to write a function enroll with the course name and when it is called that function will make checks all prerequisite courses are, are taken and passed and course section capacity is available uh, student didn't have a semester uh, limit like six to seven courses reached so student can take it so you make that enforcement in your function because function is called and you can enforce that since uh, the record the data the state cannot be arbitrarily changed you make sure that the integrity is preserved so this was an example you can add uh, other examples like in our racial number example in encapsulation chapter uh, so one of the major uh, functions of the object is to provide that data and grid integrity through this behavior uh, so in this chapter we are going to mostly focus on this data integrity of the initialization and the other operations uh, the remaining part is actually implementation uh, as you implement the functions correctly data integrity will be pro provided but uh, for initialization you need to have uh, some special uh, cases you need to implement special cases uh, and they are called constructors also in C++ we have destructors. In all languages there will be there will be some sort of constructors. Uh, if you remember, even in Haskell modules we have this uh, constructor uh, functions, abstract data types. Uh, but in C++ we uh, also need destructors because we have heap variables that we uh, have to uh, implement. If we have to uh, care for. Okay. In Java, the structures do not exist because it's a garbage collecting language as we don't care if they are deallocated or not. In Python uh, as well, we have that. But in C++, C variables uh, are uh, among the responsibilities of the pro program. So uh, the uh, constructors are member functions, but they are not like the other member functions. Uh, so they are automatically called when uh, the storage of member is ready. That means you alloc allocate the variable uh, uh, area 100 bytes needed, for example, for attributes. Then constructor is called in order to initialize uh, them to their initial values. Uh, explicit call of constructors uh, do not make any sense uh, they only create a temporary object we are going to talk about later so we don't usually call constructors explicit uh, they don't return a value so you shouldn't use uh, return something kind of expression within them and in the syntax also there is no return value because they don't return anything they uh, update the current uh, created allocated object. Uh, we can overload them so we can have arbitrary parameters uh, of the constructors, uh, different, uh, different versions of a constructor can be implemented. Uh, so this is a typical two constructor example. The name and surname are initialized from the uh, parameters. So you either provide this syntax, name and surname is initialized and number is initialized to zero, or you don't specify any argument and they all initialize to empty strings and zero. Uh, 
we have a couple of examples here. Uh, if you, for example, call uh, define your object as person A, empty parameter construct is called. If you specify this one, declare it this way. So this is the syntax. After the variable name, you can uh, provide as uh, parentheses like that. And it is going to be calling this one. Also, you have an alternative for that. So basically, you could have, have person A is this one. So this uh, initialization syntax is also uh, passed as a parameter to your constructor in a similar way. So the effect will be the same. Uh, so the syntax is also uh, obvious here. We have A is three is converted into number constructor called by integer argument three. Same uh, with this one. So these two syntaxes are equivalent to each other. So they are equal. Uh, this is another syntax. B is constructed out of A, and it will turn out into this. Number is constructed from another number object passed by reference. Uh, and the arrays, uh, the array initializers are similarly propagated to this constructed initialization. Uh, also, uh, this type of syntax is possible in case of arrays, so that you can have number A to as number one and number zero. So this is also uh, possible. Syntax. Okay, so this is another uh, possible syntax. So in the initialization list, we can also give uh, constructor calls. Uh, uh, if uh, there is no uh, constructor implemented, we have a default empty constructor which does nothing, is assumed. That means uh, the allocation is done, but uh, the object will not be initialized. Uh, in global case, everything will be initialized with zero. Uh, in the local variable case, uh, it can be anything on uh, activation record, previous activation record, so it can be arbitrary values. That's why you, it's a good idea to implement constructors. Uh, but we have a special case here. If at least one constructor exists, we should have uh, a matching call uh, available in the constructor. So this empty constructor assumption is gone. So as soon as you uh, assume, as soon as you have at least one constructor already implemented, uh, all variable declarations should match existing constructors. Okay. No constructor at all, empty, empty constructor is welcome. But if you implement one, you should have a match. Uh, constructors are called by uh, the compiler automatically uh, for global objects at the start of the program. For local objects, it is uh, entrance to function on heap object when you call new, the allocation operator of C++. This looks a little bit familiar to, your, uh, to you, I believe. Uh, this is just declaration of the lifetime, okay. Global lifetime, local lifetime, heap lifetime. Uh, the lifetime starts at the start of the program, enters the function, and uh, when you allocate uh, with library calls, this is the same thing. Uh, so uh, the constructor call just follows the life of the uh, start of the lifetime. So this is the uh, idea of the constructors. Um, 
new and delete operators are new to C++. And instead of malloc and free, you should use them. Uh, the reason is actually the constructors and destructors in the programming language. That means if you use malloc, you will be, you will have the class allocated, but there will be no uh, issues basic or constructor call. And there is no way to call constructors later. This is another important uh, thing. So you cannot call a constructor later. So this one, for example, declare in person A, and then making this call will not do anything. Uh, it, this will uh, return the new person not modified. Okay, so uh, I believe this is an important thing to be careful about. Uh, so you don't like to, if you need to do so, if you need to uh, start a, a program with empty constructor, empty parameter constructor, and if you need to pass parameters later, uh, what you can do is simply uh, write a method, modify, modification method. So that you can modify the attributes later. So you have a set uh, function uh, to modify them later. Uh, the returning back, so we have, uh, if we use the syntax here, the person star p is new person. You can have this explicit con constructor call here. If you use it with new, a heap object is created and constructor is automatically called and a pointer will be returned, and you can use that pointer afterwards. And delete p is the reverse of that. Uh, it will free the heap variable by calling destructors. I'm going to mention, uh, talk about destructors in a moment. And the arrays, we need to be careful of one uh, trick here, and that trick is you can create it like that, so it will be an array of 100 person, the constructor call will be uh, empty. Uh, if you like to uh, pick uh, parameters, you need to use the uh, syntax. Syntax, for example, person five is person A B, person C B, person E F. Blah blah. Okay. So, okay, so it will be like that. If you uh, need to call destructors uh, during new, it will be like that. Okay, I cannot insert at the beginning. So, I assume this person five is preceded by new. So new person five is initialized with constructors this way. Uh, the tricky point here is calling delete this way, okay? Uh, now, if you like, uh, okay, let us talk about destructors, then I will give you an example uh, of constructor and destructor calls so far. Uh, Destructors are actually uh, not needed uh, if you are not using any heap variables because uh, when the lifetime of the object is over, returning a function or when you call delete, uh, simply uh, the attributes, the variables inside the object are deallocated and you don't have to do anything. But if you have some heap variables allocated during constructor or in other uh, methods uh, that are deferred by the object uh, when the lifetime is over, those heap variables will be garbage because you lose all access. Your object is gone and 
everything your objective first the are gone as well. That means they are remain as garbage in the computer's memory. Uh, Java solution is the garbage collector in C++. We don't have it, so C++ introduced distractors, very specific strict syntax, uh, till the class name and that's it. You don't have any parameter return type and so on. It is called in the end of the program for global objects, return from function and delete. And if you remember, this is uh, simply our scenario of uh, lifetime. Uh, so let us uh, write a program to indicate uh, or uh, test uh, the things we have done so far. So here, let us uh, actually, I believe I have already implemented uh, something to show them. So it is a C++ class A. It has X. Uh, it has one, two, three constructors. One is no parameter constructor, which initializes X to be zero. The other is integer constructor, which initializes uh, X to be A. Uh, we have a constructor which gets A from an A object and initialized from another object, in other words. Uh, actually, uh, there is something I like you to focus on in this example as well. It indicates well about the scope. We have uh, object B here. And we are accessing bx. bx is what? bx is private. And I am using bx like an object context. And if this was an interactive class, I would have asked this question. Is this legal or not? Because it is confusing. The answer is, this is legal. Why? Because this is a method of A, and B is an object of A. An object of A is accessed by a method of A so that X is accessible, regardless of it is private or public. So you are in the scope of A, you can access everything of A. The syntax is not a significant thing, but the Scope is. So this is an interesting example in that sense. Uh, so this is our global variable, one, two, three, one, four, one. Uh, we have main consisting of a local A, empty, B with four, C, 12. D is constructed out of B and a pointer. And then we have our stage one, our stage two, our stage three. Now let us compile cons. Then so on the right hand side I am going to show you source and the example. Sorry. Compile it. So this is okay. So now let us try to match our outputs uh, with the uh, data. Uh, so I have this is coming from this one. So it is an integer uh, constructor. This is coming from A here. This line is coming from B. And this is C, as you can see, uh, passing within parentheses versus uh, as initialization doesn't matter, they call the same function, the in-space function. 
uh, this is initialization out of an object as you see uh, here, so this one, this is our output in this case. Uh, then for uh, this one, you see no, no output, okay? okay? For this one, we don't have any output. We don't generate an output because it's the pointer. Pointer is not an object. It may point to an object it is not pointing to any object at the moment. Uh, and we go in this stage one. After stage one, uh, interesting things uh, are happening, more interesting things are happening. Uh, at, uh, I allocate an array of size two. Okay, so these two are, Oh, sorry. Uh, these two of them are coming from the same new because I have an array of size to initialize. Uh, and they are uh, constructed by our no parameter constructor here okay then it's getting more interesting because I have a function call and the initialization C is initialized to the result of uh, this function call uh, so uh, the function gets a uh, t type pointer, uh, t type value, sorry, a type object, sorry, a type object, and pass by reference object, and returns a type object. So there's something really interesting going on here. And it reports this f line, and before f line, as you can see, we have an a to a constructor. So what's really happening here is, uh, we have uh, this a is passed by value as t, and actually here you are seeing that out. Okay. Uh, however, we don't see any output for b. Why? Because b is passed by reference. You don't create a new object. You pass reference to existing object. That means no lifetime starting, no constructor call. And this will clarify pass by value of an object is our third constructor here. Then other things are happening. Uh, we have one constructor and two destructor calls. Uh, the uh, first constructor is actually uh, what we call a temporary object. And the idea here is this return value of A needs to be assigned as a result of this function F. So function F result is a new object. And that object is assigned to C. That means whatever f computes is assigned to c needs a temporary object. We are going to call that temporary object. So it will create a temporary object and it will be assigned to c. Then we'll have two destructors. One destructor is this parameter t. So one of them uh, should be uh, a is one. Yes. So it, uh, this copy constructor has some side effect. Whenever it is called an object, it will increment x by one. So in the first copy, uh, the a's 
x value uh, became one in the second copy it will become two and uh, that means we will have this two as our t and this distractor is actually this what we call the temporary object. We are going to clarify this in the following slide. Okay, this is the temporary object. So this one is T, this one is temporary object. Then we have a bunch of uh, destructor calls after three. The lifetime of all lifetime is over uh, for uh, D, C, D, A. And I'm going to talk about that order in a moment. D, C, D, A, okay. So the uh, second copy is delegate, first, first copy is delegate, uh, next copy should be 10 first and T, uh, okay, it should be like that. First 10, 10, T. Okay, D, C, B, A, and our global fish. The last one is the global. So you are, uh, I believe, observing one interesting thing here. Uh, the constructor calls are A, B, C, D, and the structure calls are D, C, D, A. And this is the point I'm asking another question to the students in class, why? One obvious, approach maybe to stack orders. Yes, you push elements on stack and you roll back. This is uh, a proper answer, but also uh, the programming language designers could have done the other way. They don't have to stick to stack way because they it's not, not work like push and pop every time. The activation record is pushed once, so it doesn't have to be that way. Constructed calls can be in any other order. But uh, the most uh, convenient order is this one. Why? Because D may refer to C, C may refer to B, D may refer to A. Actually, D refers B, others, others do not refer to each other, but we have that. That means D constructors should be called after C constructors, and it should be called after B constructors, and so on. In the same way, uh, we can uh, define, um, sorry for a moment, I need to plug my chargers. Okay, uh, in the destructor we have the uh, reverse of this. In the destructor we have uh, uh, the Since uh, D may refer C, C may refer B, B, A, uh, D in the destructor may refer C, and C may refer a, B, B may refer D. So uh, if uh, you call destructors in A, B, C, D order, A is destructed, it is not valid anymore, but C is referring it. So you will violate that. So the destructor of uh, D, maybe for C, so it will be called before that, before it disappears. That's why we have this ordering now. So the destructor bodies may refer to uh, previously referred objects, that's why we call them in reverse order. It is easy to keep in mind because you have A, B, C, D, D, C, E, B, E, that's in the stack order. So this is the uh, example of constructor calls. Uh, also, I could have shown you uh, the effect of lead here. Let us make this a five. And by mistake, let us delete P. So this is uh, previous example was a garbage example. Uh, those uh, pointed heap variables 
left as garbage at the end of your program. Now I'm correcting it in this new version. Okay, so it is giving you this error. Uh, at the end, uh, after three, uh, it says uh, complaint. This is Mac OS complaining. In another operating system or in another library, you could have no complaints at all, but you will end up in garbage. Okay? Uh, so you have something free not allocated. So P is not pointing to a single object, but it is pointing to an array. So this will be your, unfortunately you don't get a compile error for that because runtime, uh, they do not fix the data types of arrays versus objects. So in C, there is no difference between an array pointer or a single object pointer. So that's why they don't have compiler error for that. But now you could see it. These are our five heap objects on an array, and these are our five destructors in the heap array. Okay. Uh, if you allocate this way, the correct usage is this one. So you allocate only one object and they allocate as a single object. But if you allocate as an array, you have to choose the syntax. So this is our example. Now let us go back to our slides and let us see what we have next. Uh, so we have uh, already talked about uh, the first item here. Uh, the uh, in the uh, constructors uh, calls, they can use uh, each other's can uh, call each other in this special syntax, not C++ only, this is uh, for something else, I believe. So I should have uh, erased this, actually this is not correct. Uh, so the constructor definitions can call each other, so this is how you uh, reuse uh, previous constructors. So, for example, uh, uh, no uh, parameter person declares person as John Doe. Okay, that is like that. Uh, if you create an explicit constructor call, it is going to create a temporary object like this. Uh, so it is. It will be equal to this one. Okay. Uh, person TMP John, that will be a temporary object created, and P will be assigned to that temporary object. So it will be equal to this one. We will talk about assignment uh, semantics uh, later. Uh, however, in the definitions, there is no intermediate objects. There is no temporary objects like this. It is directly object is allocated and construct is called. In this one, a temporary object is created and then assignment is done, they, uh, done and the temporary object is destructed. Uh, if you like, we can have an example or show that in our example. Uh, quick switch to that area. So here, let us make Five and let us say uh, B is assigned to uh, A. If 
five five five. So in uh, as you can see here, temporary object is created. It is assigned to B and it is distracted. And everything is done in line here. And you don't see a corresponding or explicit syntax for that. Uh, this one is a special case. Uh, uh, using a constructor as the typecasting operator. Uh, it is equal to this one. So it will create a temporary object out of string jump by using the uh, constructor. And it is subject to the same thing here. Uh, the temporary object is expected at the end. Uh, and type conversion sometimes works implicitly uh, so you can do this p is jump if there is a constructor getting a string and constructing an object out of it the temporary object is constructed in the same way it is here or here and p is assigned to it. so you have to be careful about those uh, types of uses So this is just uh, written parentheses uh, mentioning this count keyword. Count keyword is heavily used uh, in C++. It is available in C, but in C++ it is uh, important if you like to restrict uh, access. For example, also there are a constant number of functions. I would like to emphasize one difference between this and this. So const car star p versus car const q. Uh, q and p are uh, car pointers, uh, but what is const changes. Uh, the uh, const keyword uh, modifies uh, the uh, closest uh, or uh, data type on its uh, right here. Okay, so uh, so in this case, it will modify cache. So star b is uh, p is a pointer to a constant character. In this case, in this case. Q is constant, okay? So our character pointers will be uh, constant. 